Hello, Hello and welcome to the Sky at Night. This month's programme is coming from Stonehenge, where we've joined the crowds to celebrate the summer solstice. In just a few hours' time, the sun will rise in a very special location over the Heelstone. People have argued about the significance of this place and its connection to astronomy for more than a hundred years. And we've looked at the connection between these magnificent stones and the skies above our heads, particularly at the moon. The creation of Stonehenge by our Neolithic ancestors still inspires us today. It was around 5,000 years ago that the first architects of the site built the grass bank and ditch, and then came the stones. This is our idea of how Stonehenge would have looked in its prime. Professor Clive Ruggles is a world expert in the study of astronomy in ancient civilizations. Clive is going to help the Sky at Night pin down the link between Stonehenge, astronomy, and in particular, the moon. The first mystery to solve is that of the Avenue, a track in the landscape, which lines up on its approach to Stonehenge with the solstice sun. Clive, you've brought us to a field, which <laughs> yep. I'm assured is very important for Stonehenge. And actually, there's a feature here called the Avenue, but I'm finding it hard to really sense this feature. Tell me a bit about yes, it. Yes, you don't see a lot in the long grass. You're actually standing in it. Chris okay. is actually standing in a ditch on one side of it. The other, the other ditch is over there. So it's a long avenue that led straight up to Stonehenge from this direction. This clearly was the way you'd come on important occasions. I should say, you don't see much here, but if you had a look at it from an aerial photo, you'd see it very clearly. Archaeologists have recently discovered that the avenue is based on a natural feature caused by glaciers. It attracted attention because it happens to align with the summer and the winter solstice sun. If you're somewhere in this landscape, some hundreds of years before there's anything here, and you see these striations and you see the sun on the shortest day of the year setting in line with them, surely that to you is going to make it seem like the most special place. It's going to be a sacred place. Because it's already lined up exactly. with this us, feature that we exactly. care about. To us, it's a coincidence of nature. But to them, what more can you ask for to, to show that this is a really special place? And perhaps that's why Stonehenge is where it is, because this is a place that's, that acquires that significance to do with the sunset all through. And then gradually people build things. They build a ditch and a bank and some timber things. And then eventually it gets enhanced and turns into what we now see. The Sky at Night has been to Stonehenge before. Hello to the first ever Sky at Night from Stonehenge. It is in fact midsummer morning. There are a great many people here, as you can see, and in a very few moments, the Druids are going to bring, begin their main procession. In 1972, Sir Patrick Moore saw a magnificent sunrise, the day before the summer solstice. Through that great arch, the heel stone in the distance, the alignment absolutely perfect as the sun comes up to its rising point over the top of the stone. And there it is. And there are very many people who have never actually seen this. I've never myself seen it before. And it really is a superb sight. Patrick also talked to radio astronomer Professor Gerald Hawkins about his beliefs that Stonehenge could be used to chart eclipses and the movements of the moon. The Aubrey holes, 56 of them. A significant number? Very, very, of course, uh, the most critical number for the moon. Uh, it's uh, three nodal revolutions of the moon's orbit. When the Stonehenge uh, people came here, they started with these holes, the ditch, the bank, and this circle. Because of the 56 Aubrey holes, and because of the alignments here at Stonehenge, it could be said to be more a moon observatory than an observatory for the sun. And uh, just as the sun rises over the heelstone at midsummer, the moon rises over the heelstone at midwinter. If this theory is true, then the builders of Stonehenge would have achieved a remarkable degree of astronomical sophistication. After all, the moon's hard to pin down. Its movements seem to have a touch of lunacy about them, and that's because of its orbit. Well, if bits of Stonehenge really are aligned with the movements of the moon, then the builders must have understood some quite complex geometry. So let's see if we're as good as they were. I've got here the Earth, and we're going to need the orbit of the moon. 
So here's the orbit of the moon. Now it's slightly tilted with respect to the Earth's orbit around the sun, which is very ably held by Clive over there. And we'll exaggerate that tilt for the purposes of this demonstration. I'm going to bring in the moon and put it directly opposite the sun so that it's in the full moon phase. Now the moon takes 27 days to do one complete lap of the Earth and end up where it started back at full moon. But of course, while the moon's been doing that, we've all moved relative to the sun. <laughs> so we're actually over here by now. And that means that the moon is no longer in the full moon phase when it's at this point. It has to move on a couple of days to be aligned with the sun. Now, if that was all that was going on, building Moonhenge would be easy because the moon would rise and set at the same points on the horizon every single month. So you'd only need a couple of stones and the job would be done. But things are more complicated than that. The complication is something called precession, and that makes this experiment a little more cumbersome. Right, so I'm going to get out the way and we'll hold the Earth from down here. So all precession is, is a wobble. And that means that the moon's orbit, which is tilted, moves around and the position of full moon gradually sinks lower. And it takes years for this to take place, but then it gets to its lowest point and then comes higher again and eventually returns to there. And that's why it takes almost 19 years for the full moon to appear in our sky in the position where it started. Even despite its complex orbit, we can chart the moon's movements, and it seems there might just be some connection to Stonehenge. In any given year, the sun has two extreme positions, its summer sunrise and its winter sunrise. The moon does something similar, but it takes 27 days, the lunar monthly cycle. Clive is going to help us map out moon rises over the 19-year cycle. First, we need to see what the moon does over the course of a lunar month. Pete is holding one lunar position, and Chris is holding the other. It's pretty much full moon at the moment. The full moon's going to be rising just a little bit this way from the We found center. a full moon. Well done, Thank Chris. That's moon. excellent. <laughs> Good. OK, so that's moonrise now, but of course, yep. over the course of a month, the moon rises at different positions. Exactly. What you'd see is it moving up and down an arc on the horizon, just like the sun, but doing it up and down in 27 days. And in fact, it would reach all the way to peat, so at the and most peat. northerly extent yep. of moonrise up there. Yeah. So, but that's true now, and mm -hmm. of course, because of the complexities of the moon's orbit, yep. we need to move Chris and, uh, well, Chris and Pete right, occasionally. Well, because with the moon, these limit positions every month change gradually. So if we now roll the time forward to, eventually we're going to get to 2015, that's enough, that's enough. Then we're going to reach a position here, and so by 2015, you'll find the moon is only going up and down between these inner limits. But then, it starts to come back again, and if you both move out, if we go over another almost 10 years, up past, to 2025, past the point of midwinter sun, right out the same distance in the other direction, this is where the moon is going up and down in 2025. It's called a major standstill year. And in that time, then there are certain times every month when the moon is going to be rising extremely far south, much further south than the sun ever rises, and also much further north. And those are the things that we think there might be alignments from Stonehenge. That's so. where some things do appear to be aligned at Stonehenge. Well, let's go into the centre of the circle let's and let's take a look at those alignments. Once every 19 years, the moon will rise at its most southerly position. Just over nine years later, the moon will set at its most northerly position, in exactly the opposite direction. The question is, did Neolithic man use Stonehenge to mark these points? This reconstruction of Stonehenge shows four stones around the edge. Called the Station Stones, these seem to mark the limits where the most southerly moon rise and the most northerly moon set occur. Today, two of those stones are missing, so we've sent the Sky at Night team to mark the places where they once stood. So those are the hmm. station stones, and what exactly are they uh, lined up with? Well, most importantly, they're lined up with the axis of the monument, and that makes us think generally, we don't know exactly, but it makes us think generally they're probably put there much the same time as the, the big stones. The so south. how does that get us to but the moon? But the other way, they're pointing in 
two of these lunar directions, give or take a degree or two. So to the northwest, they're pointing um, very close, in fact, to where the moon theoretically would set as far north as it ever sets. To the south, a little bit close to where the moon rises at its furthest south. The station stones do stand out. It's intriguing that they have this, this lunar direction to them. People talk about a <laughs> yeah. Neolithic observatory. Right. Is, is that justified? Can we uh, go that far? I don't like the word observatory because that implies that people built this for astronomy and that that was its exclusive or main purpose, and I'm sure that wasn't the case. But neither was it the case that it had nothing to do with astronomy. Clearly this solstitial axis meant something. I don't think they were using it to time the longest day or the shortest day accurately in our terms at all, but I do think that they were timing seasonal ceremonies, festivities, other activities, within, which in their way of thinking of things would have been absolutely essential to keep all the seasonal things functioning, ancestral spirits could be used to help regenerate crops or whatever needed to be done to bring things about successfully in the next year. It's seven o'clock now and they've just opened up the site to all the excited visitors. And also the sun's come out and the moon is rising behind us. When you're in a landscape like this, it's hard not to think about what's happening in the sky relates to us here on Earth. For some, the moon rising or setting over the station stones is just an intriguing coincidence. Simon Banton is a keen amateur astronomer who dresses as a druid, but only to impart cosmic wisdom. Simon has studied the moon's movements at Stonehenge, and for him, the coincidences add up to something more. But he's still got to convince Pete and Paul, who are a little skeptical. I did stand here on the North Barrow in 2006 at the greatest southerly moonrise right. and watched the moon rise over the station stone that Hawkins identified mm -hmm. as being a marker for that event. The problem is that the markers are marking the positions where the moon sort of goes to its maximum extent and then back roughly. again. It's so important to say roughly. The, the, the precision aspect of it may sometimes okay. get overblown. So that's a, a watch for at least 18.6 years yes. and probably for several of those cycles. It is important to note though that if you do watch the moon rise over the heel stone, it can rise in a range that's to the right of it and yes, to the left sure. of it. Yes. And when it rises over the heel stone in the same way that the sun does, then there will be an eclipse either of the moon that night at full moon or two weeks later of the sun. Which is quite incredible really. And now, it? It, now I don't say that it's planned, but to notice it. Yes. To notice it and then go well, that's interesting. Let's count, because these people have got counting. They're not idiots. So we're just having the opening ceremony right now. Druids have started the celebrations that you can hear. It's a bit like church service I went to as a kid. We've had some communal singing, we've had a bit of a sermon, and everyone's happy to be here. And it's not raining, so maybe there's something in it. Some of the revellers are settling down for the night, but all the time, people are streaming into the site. The estimate is that more than 20,000 people will be here for sunrise. It's very lively, but it's friendly, and I think it's not too far from how our ancestors would have celebrated their solstice. Right now, the sky's looking good, the moon is out, and it's only a few days away from being full. Pete, Lucy and I find a quiet spot away from the crowds. This month, we're launching our latest observing challenge, and it's all about Sir Patrick Moore's favourite object, the moon. Called the Moore Moon Marathon, we want it to be something everyone can take part in. 
Pete, you've devised some real treats for us. What have you got in store? Well, the moon is one of the loveliest things we can see in the night sky. And what I hope I've done is put together something which makes it very accessible for people. Yeah, this is the nice thing about looking at the moon. I mean, finding the moon is the easiest astronomical Absolutely. task. And there are things you can notice even with the naked eye. So we start off in the first of the sections uh, with the lunar seas, and you can see them just with the naked eye. That's right. So the lunar sea is easy to pick out and then we progressively move on. So we're moving into crater territory on the next section and then into what I call shaded craters, the ones which you can see close to the terminator. So the first ones are easy. You can, see, you can pick the first ones out on the full moon. Give us a flavour. What are some of your favourite objects that are in there? Well, I've had a bit of fun at the end of the marathon because I've got a, what I call lunar specials. Things like the basketball player in the moon, and okay, the I've never hang seen on, a basketball on, player. On, the lunar seas, when you look at them, you can make shapes out of them. It's like seeing faces in clouds. Right, like if the you man like. in the moon. That's right. right. Basketball player is there and he's throwing a ball, and the ball is the Mare Crisium. Oh, elf on its own on the Yeah, road. that's okay. right. And once you've seen these things, you can't stop seeing them. So if you'd like to get involved, all you have to do is go to our website, bbc.co.uk forward slash sky at night, and download the forms. Give it a go and see how far you get. Already the night is almost over and we're joining the throng back at Stonehenge for sunrise. I'm going to try and get inside the circle with the drumming druids. From out here we can't even see the heel stone so the sun will rise over there in about 20 minutes. But it's only the people on the axis, the very middle of the monument, that actually get a good look. Lucy and the rest of the team have bagged a safer spot away from the more enthusiastic celebrants. So we're here waiting for the sunrise. We only have about 20 minutes to go now and the excitement in this area is really picking up. It is. It's, yeah. it's heaving, isn't it? And it's remarkable how quickly the sky has brightened in the last just 10, 15 yeah, minutes, it has, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah you, you did wonder whether the sun was actually going to make an appearance. Actually, I still wonder that because it's, yeah, it's <laughs> slightly <laughs> drizzly. So <isn't> murky. <laughs> it's it's been only a, very cloudy. It's been a good evening. There's been a whole, really a good session here, I thought. I found the whole atmosphere really most interesting. Incredible, yeah. It really was. Well. Well, it's just a couple of minutes before sunrise and the focus is still on the circle, but we're where the action is with the heel stone right behind us. Well, I'm afraid there are no breaks in the cloud. It's another damp, drizzly, summer solstice sunrise. Sharing this often absurd but still entrancing event with 20,000 people has been quite an experience. It's one I will not forget and I might well come back. The moon's role at Stonehenge will always provoke debate and speculation. After all, we'll never really know whether the position of the stones was deliberate or just a coincidence. But I hope whoever put them there would at least be pleased that we're still arguing about them all these thousands of years later. In next month's programme, we celebrate a very special birthday as NASA's Curiosity rover reaches its first anniversary on Mars. And so, until next month, from the sky at night, Goodbye. Goodbye. Tonight's film won Jane Fonda an Oscar, seducing Donald Sutherland's weary New York detective Clute, a classic 70s thriller, coming up next. <laughs>